I also wanted to remind everyone this is so this is 500. This is also 10 years. So uh, I Woo! am president of. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so I'm I'm president of the board of of Shy Hack Night. Uh, I want to just acknowledge all the people who make this event possible. Uh, of course, you, everyone who's in this room and who's watching on the live stream, uh, but also our board members and past board members. If board members and past board members want to like wave or say hi, thank you. And then also, if you're a member, a Shy Hack Night member, could you raise your hand and make yourself recognized? Thank you to all, all of our members and board members. Uh, yeah, the, it, it's certainly a, a many person show to make this happen and make this possible. 10 years is a long time. A lot of things do not last 10 years. So uh, thank you for sticking with us through everything, including the pandemic and all the ups and downs. And we're all still here. So here's to 10 more years. Woo! 2032, here we come. Um, all right, so we're going to uh, transition to lightning talks. So uh, there are seven. These are the ones uh, in the order we're going to see. Um, five of them are in person, and two of them um, are pre recorded videos. Some folks couldn't make it in person tonight. Um, so we have a, a video that we're going to play for everybody for theirs. Um, the theme for the lightning talks was how has Shy Hack Night changed you or impacted you or your organization? And we ha all the talks are sort of in that theme, right? We're going to hear personal stories about what people got out of Shy Hack Night by attending. We're going to hear the, um, some projects that came out of Shy Hack Night. Um, so uh, yeah, just it's just really just to reflect on the last 10 years of what we've done and what we will continue to do here at Shy Hack Night. Um, so I think, Eric, you're our first Lightning Talk presenter. This podium feels very like, like good evening. We are gathered here today to celebrate this crazy thing called life. <laughs> hey everybody, my name's Eric. I am on the board of Shy Hack Night. Uh, and I've been coming for a while, not as long as Derek. Um, but I am just gonna share briefly some poorly prepared remarks about uh, how Shy Hack Night has affected my life um, through a series of mostly pictures that I can't see. <laughs> But it's okay, you'll be able to see them. Um, so I've kind of was thinking and reflecting on this. It was really interesting, uh, especially for me, because I love thinking and reflecting about myself. Um, but hopefully you find it interesting too. I was also thinking about Shy Hack Night and how when I first started coming, I didn't really know what hack meant. I didn't know how to code. I didn't work in tech. Um, and I always really liked this definition that we kind of had of like hacking as being uh, taking something that already exists and repurposing it for something else. I also looked up some definitions on Urban Dictionary, which I wanted to share with y'all because I thought they were pretty great. Uh, so w one part of uh, a, a definition is to jury rig or improvise something inelegant but effective, usually as a temporary solution to a problem. Uh, another bit that stuck out to me was a clever or elegant technical accomplishment, especially one with a playful or prankish bent. Uh, and then I also like the last definition I found, which is a cheap, mediocre, or second-rate practitioner. Uh, for those of us with imposter syndrome in the audience, that might ring true for you. Um, and that kind of like is how I shy hacked my life. So I started uh, early on. Uh, here's a picture of uh, my old life, what I used to look like uh, as a young, younger person. Um, so I first moved to Chicago as mostly a musician and an artist. Um, and began getting involved in local politics around like 2014. Uh, that's me in Obama's office when he uh, was in the state, uh, was he state center or state house representatives? It was a long time ago. Anyways, um, and then around that time, I first heard about Shy Hack Night uh, and came to an event when it was up at 1871. I tried to see if there was uh, footage I could find of me, but you'll just have to pretend that I'm in this poorly pixelated video somewhere, because I totally was uh, somewhere around like number 70 or 30. I don't know. I forgot. So um, you, I also found some, some footage when we moved to... Uh, 1871, uh, you can see, and, and look how just like how much higher fidelity uh, media has gotten on the internet, isn't that great? Um, so a lot of the reasons like why I first started coming, like I said, I didn't really know how to code. I just kind of thought it was interesting. It felt like relevant to my life. There uh, were a lot of people talking about stuff that felt relevant. Um, a lot of breakout groups were organized by topic back then. So there was 
like a transportation breakout group, an education breakout group, an environment. And at the time, I was doing work in transportation. And so it seemed pretty clear to me that I was like, oh, every Tuesday, there's free deep dish pizza, a bunch of interesting people who are talking about stuff that I'm curious about and a topic that I, is in a field that I work in. Pretty cool. So I went like once or twice and then stopped coming. Uh, and I didn't come back for like another year or so. Uh, and then I started attending regularly. Um, and I just found, you know, this stuff going on interesting, but I, I wasn't really like as directly involved. Uh, it was mostly like free food and a place to talk every week. Um, but then as I continued to go, I got more involved. Um, and so this is some photos of me at some conferences I went to in 2015, which I heard about through Shy Hack Night. We went to Transparency Camp in DC, uh, went to a Code for America summit, and like really kind of just started getting exposed to more people working in these fields, just kind of talking to them, finding what's interesting, uh, you know, figuring out ways to you know, travel to different cities and learn, learn new stuff. And around this time is when I started teaching myself how to code largely through coming to Shy Hack Night every week and really kind of started to see it as something that I was interested in doing. So I started working in breakout groups and participating uh, and, you know, potentially like in mind thinking, you know, this could be something that I could do for a living that I was also looking for a way to have positive social in impact, but also like do it in a way that felt sustainable for myself personally. Um, and this was a really key um, moment in my life for me and for the people I was involved with who are part of this community who are so willing to help me answer questions about, you know, how do I run this script or where do I do this or like how do I debug something? And uh, I don't have time to talk about it, but it stands in my mind as I can think of very uh, significant moments for me uh, in learning how to learn this sort of stuff with like programming and stuff that for those people was probably like, oh, okay, like, uh, you know, I code a lot in Python. So it's like, I remember when someone taught me to how to do DIR or VARS to see like, oh, variables or methods of a function you're trying to run. I was like, whoa, okay, so I can keep going with that. Um, and, you know, that's a huge part of learning and getting involved in, so over time, that kind of led to uh, what I would say acceptance. You know, I started getting more involved. I started thinking of myself with the identity of someone who is, was a civic technologist. Uh, and over this time, like I think as a community too, we started to learn the sort of longer term, medium or longer term effects of projects and actions and try to think with more responsibility and focus on accessibility. And that was a lot of what we did. And I was able to as a professional kind of adopt this attitude even in like the work that I'm doing to try to make stuff accessible, teach people how to use technology and use it myself. Uh, we did satellite events all over the city where we uh, tried to help people engage in these sort of ways. And I don't even know how much time I have left. Um, okay, I'll keep going. Um, and so this is kind of a phase that I would say I'm, I'm still at in some ways too, just learning how to, how to operationalize all the stuff that I learned at Shy Hack Night as a job, you know, and that's something I've been doing for a couple years now. Um, and so kind of like large takeaways I was thinking about, um, you know, like five hours ago <laughs> when I was putting together this talk. Uh, for people who are new, uh, you know, these things, like it takes time to learn how to do this stuff, you know, uh, and it's easier to see in retrospect I think, you know, there's at least one person who said they were just learning how to code and it's okay to take your time, not expect like an overnight success. Uh, it's definitely, I think, a tortoise in the hare sort of situation. You, if you make a habit out of it, you'll see this stuff sort of creep up and next thing you know, you're like trying to solve a problem and you're like, wait, I actually know how to do this. Uh, and then you're like, oh wait, I'm helping other people figure it out. This is weird. Um, and I think also, for people who have those skills and want to share with them, I think being able to do this on a weekly basis is, it feels so insignificant in the moment, but those actions like compound over time and even like a simple thing that you might do to like help explain something to somebody or show them how something works and then you, you know, move on with your life and meanwhile they've like blossomed an entire career, you know, because you taught them how to debug a statement or, or how to use like notepad to, you know, run Python scripts. Uh, so those little things really do add up and matter. Uh, and I think having, I was thinking a lot about how having an accessible community is so important. Like, 
I was able to go to these conferences and meet with people. The conferences were cheap. People like said, sure, hitch a ride with me. Yes, you can crash at my place. And as someone who comes from a working class background, that like allowed me to be exposed to these fields and these careers uh, in ways that I wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And uh, things to think about, like sort of what's next. It, like, you know, this is just one story, and I have uh, plenty of my own like privileges and backgrounds that allowed this to work for me. Um, but especially thinking like as I was reflecting back, I'm like, wow, a lot of this stuff revolves around like uh, hanging out in person with people, which is something that we struggle to do now. <laughs> um, so I don't really, I don't have an answer to that. Like, what's next? Like, what do the next 10 years look like? You know, as we're trying to do sort of hybrid models, I would encourage all of us to like think and discuss about. Uh, it's also true that like burnout is an issue with any like volunteer organization and you know, people have come and gone in this community, which is also kind of the nature of the way it is, but it makes me wonder if there's ways to keep or make things more sustainable. Uh, I've been wondering why I'm so tired all the time. I'm sure you might like feel similarly after these past two years. Looking back on all this, I'm like, how did I do all that? I don't, I don't think I could do it now. I think I would take a nap. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just figured I'd, I'd leave you with that. Feel free to talk to me afterwards. And uh, I just uh, encourage us all to kind of like, you know, celebrate where we've been and also think about where we might head next. So thanks. So this um, next presentation is from is one, a video. This is um, how many of you folks here know who Kyla Williams Tate is from Smart Chicago Collaborative? Um, she's been part of our community for a lo very long time. Um, now she's working at the county, uh, and uh, she unfortunately couldn't be here in person to in person tonight. Um, so we asked her to uh, uh, give a talk and, and pre-record it uh, and share it with all of us. So uh, she sent this over to us. Uh, I have not watched it yet, so uh, here we go. <laughs> When I started at Smart Chicago Collaborative in 2011, I had no idea what a tech meetup was. And honestly, I had some resistance to going to one because I've experienced racism and further how digital inequity has impacted generations of people who look just like me. I wasn't a coder, I didn't have a fancy title inside of government tech, and I wasn't an executive at a tech firm, so I didn't know what to expect. But then I met Derek Eder and Christopher Whitaker and Josh Kalos and so many others at my very first hack night. And although I felt like a fish out of water, they were incredibly welcoming to me. Since attending my very first Shy Hack Night, I've partnered on initiatives like Women in Tech Speaker Series. I've had Derek speak at my own tech equity programming at my family foundation. And I've presented at Shy Hack Night on several occasions. My participation with this group has positioned me to be considered a leader in the digital equity space and it has increased my opportunities to speak about it. I always reference Shy Hack Night wherever I go and how this group operates in the open, shares resources, and strategically is connected to our region's tech post points. And that's really powerful. It's a blueprint to follow for establishing leadership strategy, not only in technology, but beyond. Shy Hack Night demonstrates what advocacy, organizing, and consensus building can look like, even while acknowledging its own challenges with diversity and racial equity. There were several people from Shy Hack Night that encouraged me to apply for the open digital equity role at Cook County. And now, as the inaugural director of digital equity for Cook County, I know that for me to get this right, I must have members of Shy Hack Night working with me and involved. So check your email, check your voicemail, check for the shout outs because I will be looking for you. Happy 500th episode, friends. And in the words of Christopher Whitaker, woo. Oh, I'm next. I, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a website, decarbmystate.com. Uh, this is not a talk about carbs. Uh, it is a talk about when we say decarb, we mean decarbonize. And so that means that this is a website about climate change. So climate change, we're doomed, right? 
Well, let's take a look at what the current situation is. Uh, right now, we're looking at about one degree of uh, additional warming uh, above normal levels. Uh, at two degrees warming, which is where we're headed, uh, we're going to see more desertification. We're going to see more flooding. At three degrees, things start to get a little bit scarier. We have ecosystems breaking down. We have intense hurricanes. We have lots of fires. We have literally hundreds of millions of people being displaced from where they live because the places in the earth are no longer um, possible to live in. And at four to eight degrees is basically the apocalypse, like Mad Max or Waterworld. Take your pick. OK, so uh, good news is that actually, according to recent changes and the science, the actual projected uh, increase in temperature by the year 2100 is going to fall somewhere between 1.5 and 3 degrees. So that means that um, the worst possible scenario, the apocalypse, actually is very likely not going to happen. So my first lesson for you is when you talk about climate change, and this took me a while to get there, don't be a doomer, right? Don't just think it's all hopeless, because actually things are already getting better. It's up to us to do something to help make it better faster. So you can do something, and it will make a difference. But you're asking, but what? So you may have heard some things that you could do to help stop climate change. Don't waste food. Don't fly. Don't use plastic straws. Eat less meat. Take the bus. Insulate your home. Recycle. To that, I say, meh. <laughs> These are efficiency and lifestyle changes. And they're OK. They're good. You should do them. By all means, do them. But they only get us, even if everybody does it, like 10 to 15% of the way there. And in case you didn't know, the number we have to get to is zero. Zero emissions by 2050 so we can avoid the worst possible outcomes of climate change. So. Our group at Chai Hack Night were inspired by focusing on a bigger picture. Most of the emissions in our society come from our machines, the way we heat our food, heat our homes, the way we get around, driving our cars, and of course the power plants, coal and oil and gas that produce the electricity we use every day. Here's an idea. Replace the dirty machines with clean ones. This is not a new idea. It's called clean electrification. And if you see here on this chart, we have uh, a simple way of looking at this kind of complicated problem. If you break it down into these broader categories of the buildings we live in and work in, the ways we get around transportation, and then the power that we actually produce, that's actually a huge chunk of the problem. And there is still other stuff. We're like not saying that doesn't exist. But this is a huge piece of the, the, of the puzzle, if focusing on just clean electrification. So we built a website to help you with this. Go, you can go right now, it's live, to decarbmystate.com. And we've done a number of things for you. We've pulled together a bunch of data from all, a bunch of different data sources about all 50 states in the US, plus DC. We have the emissions. We have all the electrification of vehicles. We have all the information that you need to know to start counting all these machines we have to replace. You get a map like this. It actually shows you here is all of the states and how they're shaded is based on how much pollution they emit every year. And if you can see from this map, Illinois is actually not doing well. We are the third highest in emissions. We're tied with Pennsylvania and Florida. Texas is the worst, by the way, in case you didn't know. Uh, so despite the fact that we have a, Republic, or a, a Democratic governor and Democratic control of Congress and all these people care about climate change, and we passed like a really uh, ambitious climate law in the state of Illinois, known as the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, CJA, we still have a long ways to go. So you can do things here in Illinois that matter. You don't have to worry about what's going on in DC and like fume at Joe Manchin, right? You can actually do real things locally to make a big difference in climate change here. This is the emissions in Illinois over time. You can see the brown area is the emissions that have happened. The green area is our optimistic scenario of let's turn it all to zero, right? 
It's probably not going to look like that, but that's the idea. Uh, but you can also see it's already started to dip down. Like the emissions have started to decline across the board, which is why we're not in that like apocalypse scenario anymore. If you go to this website, decarbmystate.com, you can look at any state, and we've counted every single power plant. We've counted all the cars that are there, which ones are electric and which ones are not, all the buildings and which ones have been electrified or not. So you can see how well is my state doing, where do I still have to go, what are those coal plants that we need to shut down? Is one close to my home? Can I go join an organization and a campaign that's trying to shut it down right now, right? You can actually go find and Google each one of these coal plants and find out what's going on. We have, like I said, all this information about what's happening. Uh, this is the numbers for Illinois. As you can see, we have a lot more EVs, electric vehicles, that need to be sold. Uh, we need to stop selling gas cars, gas-powered cars. Like, your next car must be electric. So in Illinois, if we focus on those big pieces, that is 65% of the problem. And that is a huge chunk of getting us th all the way to solving the climate change problem. So go to decarbmystate.com. And you can learn how to get started. We have not only this information, but ways to electrify your own home. We have resources for that. And then also um, resources on how to get involved in political campaigns and elect candidates that actually care about this issue and will push for those policy changes to electrify everything else. Uh, and then we can be all part of this awesome future of a decarbonized, electrified future. And we can actually keep the global temperature down below the three degrees and shoot for something more, uh, more habitable for everybody, like two degrees. Uh, I'd like to thank all the people who worked on this website at Shy Hack Night over the last six months. Juan Pablo Velez, Victor Coves, Sean Watland, Howard Keir, Dylan Halpern, Eliza Rudolph, Joyce Sohiri, Samantha Goodman, Shelby Barron, Jack Maddens, Sarag Nilthapati, and Robert Herrera. Uh, if you're in the room, by the way, say hi. Thank you. Yay! We did it! And of course, to tie it all back to tonight's theme, thank you, Shy Hack Night. This, is not, this project would not have been possible without Shy Hack Night itself being the space where we can come together and find like-minded individuals and work on projects that matter. So thank you. Hello, hello, hello. All right, so when I first came up with the title for this talk, I was like, wow, start, start where you are. That is just, it's so inspirational, it's so wise. Like, it's just really an amazing title for a talk. And then I was like, well, maybe I should just Google it just to, just to make sure it's, it's original. Um, so I Googled it, and I found out that, no, unfortunately, there, there are many, many things that have been published with this very title. Um, so that was a little bit disappointing, but on the other hand, it's so unoriginal, I can still use it, and it's not plagiarism. And I still like it. So here we are at the starting point. And if someone did come up with that um, delightful little phrase, congrats. It's really, it's really good, whoever you are. Um, so I first heard about Shy Hack Night in early 2016 from an email with the title Mixer Tonight with Nar Nar Shred Town. And the text of that email is included in its entirety right here. And it is not a stretch to say that this email, yes, this very email, changed my life. This email that mentioned something called the shithole. <laughs> I actually never made it to the shithole, so I don't, it was a very famous improv venue. Um, so I had just moved to Chicago to do improv for a living, and um, since that's not really a thing, I was actually, for money, I was editing internet articles from home on things like the best islands in the Philippines to visit and what different colors of poop mean. Um, please ask me about that later. It was a riveting article. Um, I was lonely and it was winter and I was looking for a way to meet people. I just moved from San Francisco, so the tech sector seemed familiar. And I was like, sure, like a hack night. That sounds fun or something or kind of different. I don't know. I'll try it out. And I had no way of knowing that six years later, Shy Hack Night would be the thing that brought me a community, a new career, and even a life partner. I think I was supposed to flip. Oh, yeah, so that's career. This is the career slide. <laughs> Engineering. And then that's the life partner <laughs> who had to leave, unfortunately, earlier. <laughs> so the first time I, shied, I showed up to Shy Hack Night, I was late. It was a little bit past eight, and everyone was already doing breakout groups. And 
I was very nervous to be surrounded by all these strangers. And so I, I just went and sat down. I introduced myself and I was like, I, have, I really don't know what's going on. I'm new here. And then I proceeded to like spew a lot of information at these very kind group leaders about this awesome book I was reading called The Lean Startup. And I told them about MVP, like you the, the smallest of work, amount of work possible. And I was very excited about all of it. I'm sure they were very annoyed. <laughs> but you know what? That was the first timer's mistake. We all do it. But you know, at the... I left that event, and I, I didn't really know what had happened. I was kind of in this daze, <laughs> like, wow, I felt exhilarated. I had shy hacked, and I was hooked. So I decided to keep on coming back. And after several months, I got up the courage to co-host, and that turned out to be a gateway drug to being a regular co-host, and then starting a breakout group focused on fun called the Fun Congress. Then I helped see Shy Hack become a nonprofit, and then I served as a board member, and uh, at the same time, I was starting a career in software engineering, which, by the way, does pay slightly better than improv. And um, I was doing, a, I went through a boot camp to do that, and like I started working on the in the job market. And then I had also start met I start I met and then started dating my now husband um, at Braintree. I didn't date him there. I mean, not not all the dates were there. Some of them were. We did think about that as a wedding venue possibility, but um, it was complicated because of the pandemic. <laughs> So I didn't really know what I wanted when I started coming to Shy Hack Night. I had just had a sense that this was a good place with interesting people, and I wanted to be around them more and maybe even be like them or like some of them. And there was no agenda that I had aside from the agenda, the holy agenda that governs Shy Hack Night. So, okay, so why the title Start Where You Are, that amazing, incredible, genius title? I was like, well, I feel like I am once again like at some sort of inflection point. You know, it's like, okay, like, so great, I, I'm married, yay, software engineer, yay. Like, but like, what happens now? I feel like I haven't like achieved it, whatever it is, and um, I don't know what's next. I don't have to tell anyone in this room about all the terrible things that are happening in the world, and that's not the point, though. I feel like coming to Shy Hack Night has showed that there are actual helpful ways, not spewing tech solution ways, of being part of pieces of a solution. And we'll find out what that's going to be. But I do know that I am in a different place than I was six years ago. I know more, I can do more, and from my time with Shy Hack Night, I'm okay with not knowing what the destination is. I just know that I need to stick with the community, and most importantly, stick with the process and just keep on showing up. And the next time that you see an email mentioning the shithole, <laughs> you just might want to pay attention because good things can come from emails that mention shitholes. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, another breakout group that would not have been possible without Chai Hack Night. And actually, Derek, I realized the last time we presented on this was episode 299. And, well, a bit of a spoiler. <laughs> Not too much has changed since then. <laughs> but, oh, well. Here's, here's a brief little update on kind of where we started, uh, what Chai Hack Night um, got us to, and what might uh, the future hold. All right. So back in 2013, oh, my gosh, almost like 10 years ago, uh, the Chicago Justice Project had done a report um, to look at how the Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times, was uh, covering um, violence against women, and then looking at how the, those two sources of news were um, you know, reporting on, on violence against women and comparing that to police reports, other uh, publicly available data to see you know, were the Tribune and sometimes over-reporting, under-reporting women against, uh, violence against women in certain parts of the city? What was the story there and the trend there? Um, so that was a really popular report. Right after that, then uh, Tracy Siska, who um, is founder and director of the Chicago Justice Project, um, you know, said, well, if we're doing it with those two sources, with the Tribune and sometimes, and just with violence against women, why don't we look more broadly across the Chicago media landscape? Let's look at other uh, news sources. Let's see how, how they are covering crime more generally. So can we do something larger looking beyond uh, just how the media is reporting um, about, about violence against women, 
by looking at other sorts of crimes. So they started to do that. They started looking at beyond just the Tribune and sometimes looking at you know, WBEZ, WTDW, all the other kind of major news outlets and looking at how all of them are covering crime. Um, you can imagine that if, if you're just constantly trying to keep up with all of the news sources um, and what they're covering, it became, if somebody was just doing it on their own, which is what they were doing, just having human volunteers go to these websites and checking them, it became way too onerous and way too difficult uh, to do that. So that was the impetus for Chicago Justice Project coming to Chai Hack Night. They needed a, a more sustainable, a better way of, of going about uh, collecting all these news articles across Chicago's uh, media landscape on how they were covering crime. So um, they came to Chai Hack Night. How we helped uh, the Chicago Justice Project was really in two uh, main ways. The first way was putting together a scraper. So instead of having human volunteers physically go to the Tribune's website or Sun-Times website, pull in all the news articles and so forth, wrote a scraper to automatically every two hours go to all those uh, news sites and, and pull them in. So we started that uh, in 2016, 2017. And in the past... Uh, what is that now, six years? We're now up to over 800,000 articles that we have scraped uh, from all the major Chicago media sources. So we had, now have a huge amount of data. Um, and then the other main thing that Chai Hack Night uh, helped with is you can imagine hundreds of thousands of articles trying to manually going through each one to see, A, is it about crime? And if it's about crime, what crimes is it about? And where are those crimes located? We were trying to get those kind of three pieces of, of information out, types of crime and any sort of location information. Um, you know, having somebody go through ten, tens or hundreds of thousands of articles was just way too much. So the other main piece that Chai Hack Knight helped with this project was putting together a machine learning algorithm using natural language processing to automatically go through um, all those articles and pull out what types of crime the article is reporting and any sort of location data. So um, we now have all that information for those roughly 800,000 articles. So lots and lots of data. Um, very briefly, uh, what, we've, what we're trying to kind of do with it eventually. So this is actually, <laughs> I said the exact same slide from that 299th episode. <laughs> so how much has changed? But this was data that um, we had pulled from 2015. So we also kind of backfilled a lot of the um, articles from when we started in 2016, 2017. Um, and you can see like, this is just a little snippet of, of what we think kind of the larger story is, right? So just looking at burglary, for example, you know, a lot of the me media, it appears to be uh, perhaps um, under-reporting where a lot of that uh, crime happens, where burglary happens, particularly like on the south side, but in the more affluent uh, parts of North Chicago, where it actually happens less, it gets reported a lot more, right? So it's kind of a discrepancy in terms of how media is, is covering it. So this is what we are kind of trying to eventually work towards. But you can imagine with like 800,000 articles and just a huge mass of data, it's very, very difficult. The data is very, very messy. Um, so we are continuing to work on it these past few years. <laughs> and, and it's just kind of a never, never ending process. But uh, Chai Hack Night has gotten us this far and we're hoping it will get us uh, even further. Um, and even as we have kind of worked on uh, that project and, and continuing to do bits and pieces of it along the way as we can. Um, Chai Hack Night has continued to help uh, Chicago Justice Project in, in many other ways. Um, so just as a brief example, so Tracy Siska with the Chicago Justice Project actually moved to Washington, D.C. a few years ago. So he's also kind of involved with, with that scene as well. And one of the things that they had wanted to do, um, which is kind of relevant for, for Chicago as well, D.C. also has a a gang database, and so they wanted a uh, way that people could just um, very easily and quickly 
uh, basically uh, submit a FOIA request to see if they are on that gang database or, or not. Um, and so Chicago Trust Project again came to myself and, and Chai Hack Knight to see if we can put together a kind of easy form for uh, people to, to do that. So that's one of the things that we had worked on um, as well in the last couple of years. So also just various other side projects that Chai Hack Knight has been able to help the Chicago Trust Project along the way. Um, but yeah, like I said, in, in the future here, we do have just a massive amount of, of data. So those 800 plus thousand articles, all the location data, crime data that goes along with it, it's like over two gigabytes. Um, and so we're also just looking for people and opportunities to figure out how, how to work with that data more and, and kind of do some more reports, visualization from that. Um, we also keep toying with the idea of doing some sort of like sentiment analysis, so also looking at not only how the media is covering crime, but in those articles then too, right, they'll often be reporting um, about uh, police, either police directly related to crime, uh, police abuse, that sort of thing, or just generally, you know, talking about the police being involved. Um, in reporting a crime, responding to a crime, something like that. So we're also looking to see if we can do some sort of sentiment analysis to see if the media, by and large, talks positively about the police or negatively about the police or is more neutral about the police. Um, so we're to do that. And uh, as I kind of mentioned too, with all the data, we have a lot of data cleaning, which tells us that the machine learning algorithm that we did put together, it's good, it, it, it is pulling out some crime data, it is pulling out some location data, but it's oftentimes not the most accurate or most precise. So we know our, our model kind of needs some, some work and some tinkering, so we're also hoping to uh, improve that at some point and just make that uh, machine learning model better in the future. Um, so that is the status of Chicago Media Project and Chai Hack Knight's involvement with the Chicago Justice Project. So thanks to all those people. These are just a few of the people who have been involved over the years. And uh, yeah, big thanks to Chai Hack Knight for 500 more episodes. <laughs>
December right up to the wire of when I was graduating. Um, but that's how I got my first, my first job in tech. Um, and I got to work with transit data, um, which folks know now I'm facilitating the ghost buses breakout. So like spoiler date, I love transit data. Um, but this is, this job is what got me started working with GTFS. And, um, so it was a really, really great opportunity. Um, and then fast forward about a year and Derek, in, I met Derek. <laughs> uh, no, I already knew Derek, but, um, he, he posted a different job in the jobs channel and I wasn't officially looking for a job, but I saw this. And if you had designed a title in a lab specifically for me to have as a dream job, it would be GTFS data science. Uh, I think that if you click through, it was GTFS data scientist. Um, and so this was a job, I was like, this job seems so, 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 so perfect. And I applied to this and then I ended up getting this job and this is now my current job um, at Jarvis Innovations, which is a civic tech group in Philly who are really affiliated with Code for Philadelphia. Um, so kind of a Code for America ecosystem um, thing. So I have now gotten literally two full-time jobs just directly from the jobs Slack channel um, and can't recommend it highly enough. And um, I like. I think there's like a broader point besides just I was lucky. Um, I thought it was kind of a more humane and targeted way to network. Like people are usually posting jobs that are like related to civic technology, so it's not just at people who have done online job searches. It can feel exhaust. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds, and the postings are like the same, and like sometimes they're reposted, and you're like, did I already apply to this? And like it's just a little more targeted. Um, I also think it's more humane in the sense that like people are posting there, like saying, hey, I'm aware of a job opportunity. And so like, you know that they might be interested in talking to you about it as opposed to just cold messaging people on LinkedIn, which is fine if you've got to do it. Like people, you got to do what you got to do. But um, I thought it was like a nicer way to talk to people. Um, I think that this is a, a really important function that Chai Hack Night can play as kind of a civic square for people, as a place for people to connect. Like jobs are really important. A lot of people have mentioned Chai Hack Night as a way to gain professional experience. And this is like a very direct way for that to happen. Um, I also think it's mutually beneficial for Shy Hack Night. Like I'm on the board now and running a breakout group and all this stuff. And that's partially because like I literally owe my livelihood to Shy Hack Night. <laughs> so, <laughs> not, um, so, you know, it created like a, a relationship with me. Um, and also I think the Slack is like a nice way to like, reach out. I know some people have concerns with Slack because it's not officially moderated, but like uh, Shy Hack Night does have a code of conduct. Um, and like it, it felt like a, like a, place that you can reach out in a way that's kind of like, you know, curated a little bit. Um, and so, and again, I just don't love cold reaching out to people on like totally anonymous platforms. So yeah. Um, so I also wanted to close with some gratitude for anyone who's ever posted in jobs, whether they had an opportunity, they were seeking an opportunity or just talking about something kind of relevant. Um, thanks to Shy Hack Night for cultivating the forum. And then um, also shout out to people who run similar platforms. I know there's like a couple different slacks in the Chicago area that have jobs platform or jobs channels, but yeah, recommend it. If you're looking for, if you're hiring, <laughs> please post. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm like really glad that I found uh, Shy Hack Night and the Slack channel. So that's it. So this is a... A video pre-recorded uh, from Nick Lucius, who is the chief data officer for the city of Chicago. So, hey, people of Shy Hack Night, wish I could be there in person, and I'm going to get started because I don't have a lot of time. Um, so, my name is Nick Lucius, and I'm going to tell you my story of going from a lawyer to being Chicago's CTO and a few things in between. So um, for me, Shy Hack Night gave me a place to volunteer on a social impact project when I was looking for a new career. Um, I literally walked into Shy Hack Night just to volunteer on a coding project. Um, and my first night, I joined a breakout group. That breakout group I joined eventually turned into a crowdsourced beach water quality science project and helped the Chicago Park District make decisions on how they test um, the beaches for water quality. We ended up publishing our work in a peer-reviewed academic journal, um, and many shy hack nighters worked on this project. I got to come back and present on it, um, and that was just such a surreal, cool experience. My work in that breakout group 
helped both me and the city of Chicago by connecting me with the chief data officer of Chicago, um, who brought me on the data team and established my career transition out of um, the law um, into tech. So Shy Hack Knight has also given me a civic tech social network to use for both mentorship and guidance during my first years as a data scientist. Uh, and eventually, as chief data officer of the city of Chicago, Shy Hack Knight helped me test ideas and get advice on responding to a global pandemic with data-focused strategies. I got to present again um, at Shy Hack Knight, um, which was also so awesome, on uh, our equity-based data-led response to COVID. Shy Hack Knight, additionally, has given me a space for a breakout group that I hosted on open data. Uh, which helped me better understand how our community uses the data portal and especially ways that it can be improved. Shy Hack Knight has also provided a community to help guide and inspire the recently announced launch of the Chicago Digital Service, which I'm so excited about um, and I know is going to bring a future of collaboration and cool projects. Um, and now in my new role as Chicago's Chief Technology Officer, I'll keep coming back to Chicago Hack, or to Shy Hack Night to share and test ideas, gain from this community's amazing experience and expertise, and inform Chicago's leadership in delivering better services for residents. So thank you, Shy Hack Nighters. Here's to 500 more. See you next time. Okay, that's the lightning talks. Has anybody got one else? Uh, any, you want to give an impromptu lightning talk? No? No? Okay. Well, thank you everyone who presented. Um, that was a great, a great kind of run through of all the different things that are Make Shy Hack Night great. And then the last thing, I just, I should have done this earlier, but there is one person in this room among everyone who's probably been here 500 times. We don't have perfect attendance, so I'd really just love to just, for us all to just applaud Derek and thank him for making all of these 500 times happen. Well, is that a good note to go out on? I think it's a great note to go out on. To do our thing. It's so time. The, does everyone know that our catchphrase? It's go for the bag. Okay. So on the count of three, we're all going to say it together. One, two, three. Go, go forth, forth and, and hack. hack. Thank you, everyone. Woo!